Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you all for coming this morning. Hi. Hi, Nikita. <laughs> well, I thought we would start off with some music today. And Ricky is here, all set up over there. I heard some practice tunes coming through there. I did. I did. <laughs> no private sounds. <laughs> Ricky comes to us today pretty much fresh off the Quantum Love Tour. So she's been touring, and this is another stop on the tour. Yes. It's beautiful to think yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just like a few days off the tour. So it's good to be here. I'm so happy to be landed. I see you all here. Happy. It's seeping into my pores, all the joy. So thank you. <laughs> so you want you have something, you feel something, or you want to open it up like Eric did to any kind of request? Uh. What do you feel? I could be open for a request, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I had Ride of a Lifetime and I need to yeah. know in mind, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, my way. 
control. <laughs> Shall we try another one? Do you have another one coming to mind? Oh, another one. Ready to burst out? <laughs> I do need to know that I'm loved. <laughs> But like every second, so don't stop it coming. <laughs> okay, we've got our assignment today. <laughs> yeah, I wrote this a year ago, and it, and and I, my prayer was answered. <laughs> I've been loved through the year, but every time there's just yeah washing, I need to be reminded, and so, yeah, I just want to say thank you yesterday for everybody. I feel like everybody stopped to give me love and it was just, it was everything. It's very healing. So I'm just very grateful. So keep it coming.
watching out for everything and everyone, including guitars. <laughs> Doesn't want to see anything crash. <laughs> it's good. Well, the, the quote that was coming to mind, I believe Gandhi said it, um, and it's a good way to kick this off, it was uh, an eye for an eye, making the whole world blind. <laughs> Uh, when, whenever we operate in that eye for an eye mentality, like you did this to me, I'll do this to you, you know, it's almost like it's almost like a reversal of the golden rule: do unto others as you would have others do unto you. It's like it's more like eye for an eye. It's like what you did to me, I'm going to do back to you. It's like a reversal of the golden rule, and and the whole world is blind when there's revenge, when there's a motive of getting back, really getting anything, but getting back at someone, that's where hatred, that's where the seed of hatred is sown, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you know, it's like, what you did to me, I'll do to you. And then there's another one that came to mind too, the blind leading the blind, and both fall in the pit. <laughs> um, they're kind of graphic images, you know, blind leading the blind, and both fall in the pit. Because obviously, you know, if you're if you're being led, you want the one who's leading you to be seeing, <laughs> because it could be quite a quite a, a trust walk with many <laughs> many difficult things, including pits that you might fall into if you're just holding on or following someone that literally can't see where they're going. And it's interesting that this is a world of duality, so. This is a world of leaders and followers where even sayings like that make any sense, the blind leading the blind. And I would say that the present moment, or the spirit in the moment, is the equalizer. It's really, that's what forgiveness is about. It equalizes all the images of the world and shows us their sameness so that we can be steady and at peace. Not pursuing some, thinking that some images will free us and some images will imprison us, but just seeing actually that when we're seeing a fragmented world and we're seeing differences and we're seeing emphasis on differences, that it's literally about being blind. And what comes to mind is when you think of, like if I threw the word out blind, a lot of times people will say associations come to the mind, you know, like Helen Keller or, or, Stevie Wonder or, you know, different ones, Helen Keller with, you know, for deafness and when you talk about the senses. But I would say that that's the trick of the whole world, that, that when we talk about someone being blind, you think of someone who's lost their eyesight, and someone who's not blind is someone who still has their eyesight. 
but both of those are, are actually the same. It doesn't seem that way in the world. It can seem like a big difference when there's such a focus on the five senses and, and perceiving through the five senses, but, but blind and not blind are actually the same. They're just two different categories that don't have anything to do with reality. And what we need to do is start to see their sameness in order to come to what I would call spiritual vision. A lot of times people talk about what's the goal, and we talk about peace of mind, we can talk about forgiveness, we can talk about being in the present moment, but I thought today to kind of launch us all, because we're going to have a very interactive session today, but to launch us all today, I actually did something I haven't done. I don't really see this book very often, but this book is called A Course in Miracles, <laughs> and I haven't seen one of these. I was walking around today and I found one. I went, oh my gosh, look at this, it's like a relic around here. But, um, I actually um, just popped it open and it was kind of neat because I could see that there was something that was coming as a message for me to talk about today. And so some of you might be familiar with it and others not, but I thought I would just, just read through the first maybe nine or ten lessons and then I want to get into the depth of what this is all about, really. Because if we lose focus on things and our life gets complicated and we seem to have many different pursuits, it, it's very difficult and challenging when you have your mind gets set on many different goals and many different strivings. You lose track of the simplicity. So I'm just going to read through the first, we'll say, ten lessons, then I'm going to spring into this. Lesson one is, nothing I see in this room, on this street, from this window, in this place, means anything. I have given everything I see in this room, on this street, from this window, in this place, all the meaning that it has for me. I do not understand anything I see in this room, on this street, from this window, in this place. These thoughts do not mean anything. I am never upset for the reason I think. I am upset because I see something that is not there. I see only the past. My mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. I see nothing as it is now. My thoughts do not mean anything. Now that covers it. And when you actually go through those first ten lessons, did any of you ever have the why question arise with any of those? Like imagine reading lesson number one, nothing I see means anything. Did anyone ever have a little voice come in your mind and go, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> or maybe, that's pretty radical, and why? <laughs> you know? So it was interesting today, because I just, I have not seen one of these books for the longest time, but I saw one and I popped it open. And I popped it open to lesson 29, and this is what it said. It actually is emphasized, it's in bold. The idea for today explains why you can see all purpose in everything. It explains why nothing is separate by itself or in itself. And it explains why nothing you see means anything. In fact, it explains every idea we have used thus far and all subsequent ones as well. Today's idea is the whole basis for vision. So, when I read that paragraph, I thought, well, this is an important idea. <laughs> Remember, he just says saying, this is an awakened mind saying, it explains why nothing you see means anything. In fact, it explains every idea we have used thus far, and all subsequent ones as well. Every idea that we have used so far there's a, there's a 600 and some page text that comes before those lessons, and then there's a lot that comes after the manual, and all subsequent ones. So what is this idea? I'll share it with you today. <laughs> 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 
You can see that it might be kind of important. <laughs> Everyone's like, what? Is it? Did I miss that one? <laughs> what is it? And really, here it is. This is the idea, the idea for today. It's very short. God is in everything I see. That's the idea. Wow, talk about a key. If that's the idea that explains why nothing I see means anything, and every subsequent idea that you'll ever come across, that's important. Now, I, I was in university for 10 years, so I studied philosophy, among other things, and many different spiritual pathways. In fact, I was just interviewed on Buddha at the gas pump. Has anybody ever heard of Buddha at the gas pump? Yes. Very non-dual site, with non-dual teachers from all over the world. And so, I think uh, there was a few people here. I think Jenny was one of them pushing to get me on there. You should interview David. So anyway, I went on there, and I knew in the course of our, whatever, two, two plus hour interview, we would get into some depth, uh, because Rick is, is really well versed. He's really studied his philosophy, his metaphysics, and lots of, lots of non-dual teachers. And um, we got into this too. Um, it's kind of interesting because there is a, a uh, branch of philosophy that says literally that God indwells in everything. God indwells in objects. It's called pantheism, for those of you that aren't familiar with philosophy. Like God, God indwells in this cup and in this table, in this body, in this shoe, in this shoestring. Um, so what this lesson does, it's such an important lesson, um, he does give us a little claimer, disclaimer. It's nice when you get such an important idea as this, and you get a little bit of a disclaimer, because at first you're going to be going, wow, this is so important. If every idea that I've ever had, including explaining why nothing I see is, means anything, and all subsequent ideas, it must be an extremely important idea, so it's important for me to really grasp it in the fullest sense. He says, disclaimer, you will probably find this idea very difficult to grasp at this point. He's kind of saying, don't get too frustrated with this one. This is the big granddaddy, this is the mother of all ideas, so don't get too disappointed if you go, what? Or huh? <laughs> with this one, because we're going to go into it together very deeply today. You may find it silly, irreverent, senseless, funny, even objectionable. Certainly God is not in a table, for example, as you see it. Yet we emphasized yesterday that a table shares the purpose of the universe. And what shares the purpose of the universe shares the purpose of its creator. Try then today to begin to learn how to look on all things with love, appreciation, and open-mindedness. You do not see them now. Would you know what is in them? Nothing is as it appears to you. Its holy purpose stands beyond your little range. When vision has shown you the holiness that lights up the world, you will understand today's idea perfectly. And you will not understand how you could ever have found it difficult. And then as usual, it gets very practical where he starts with practice. God is in this coat hanger. God is in this magazine. God is in this finger. God is in this lamp. God is in that body. God is in that door. God is in that waste basket. That's right, he's even using garbage uh, to apply the idea that God is in everything I see, purposely to take us away from thinking that some things are holy and sacred and some things are not. And we know throughout spirituality that that's a temptation. Holy rivers, holy water, you know, holy people, saints, uh, holy energies. Hope, oh, did you go in, did you feel that vibe in that ashram? It's a holy energy. Let's go to McDonald's and talk about it. You know, <laughs> what if... <laughs> The holy energy is everywhere. What if it's right there, and you take the Big Mac apart, and you, <laughs> you're right in the middle of your Big Mac. God is in everything I see, in those chopped little onions and pieces of lettuce. Uh, you know, you have to realize how happy you would be 
to, to know the experience of God is in everything I see. And he mentioned the word vision. Um, it's a very important kind of word. Sometimes it's called vision, Christ vision. It's not with the body's eyes. And it's not through the five senses. And I feel really grateful in this lifetime that I've had three like revelatory experiences where the whole world first had collapsed, the figure ground collapsed, and the, all the differences. It kind of looked like a picture or a painting. And then, then it was like this blazing light that came through, and then the whole world disappeared. So I've kind of had three disappearance of the universe experiences, and they were, they were all glimpses of vision. Spiritual vision is a vision that doesn't involve the five senses. And that's important because we need a context for what we really need to focus our mind on. We think we're, we're focused on survival, on making a better life for ourselves, for our families, for our bodies. Um, I think much of the human condition is trying to overcome ailments, little pains, little struggles with the body. You know, you wake up and your your ear has some wax in it or something, and you, you spend the next 20 minutes or an hour trying to get the thing unclogged so you can go through your day. Or you wake up with a twitch in your eye, and you think, oh, this is great, I've got to go to work with my eye going like this all day long. It's going to be very embarrassing. Or, or, you know, you get a little hangnail, you know, and you're going through your day, and it's just like, you know, you know what, even the hangnail, you know, just think of how the mind, what it can get on. You could spend the whole day or some days on like, like a little hang, hangnail, or like an ingrown nail. Well, then you, 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 what can you do? Then you have to go to a, like a podiatrist, somebody you know to help you. You see how so much attention goes onto the comfort of the body, and really, I could just say eliminating discomforts. Some people could say I could just live with no discomforts. You know. You go ahead, minimize the pleasures, but just please give me no discomforts. If I could just have a life where I ease through with no discomforts. And this, these lessons are kind of calling us to go much deeper. You know, drink of me and you will never thirst again. That kind of stuff. That kind of stuff. All the way down to the core. So, he says in here, he goes on in his next lesson to kind of explain the first one. He says, God is in everything I see because God is in my mind. The idea for today is the springboard for vision. From this idea will the world open up before you, and you will look upon it and see in it what you have never seen before. Nor will what you saw before be even faintly visible to you. So, when we talk about spirituality, really, it's important to remember, if you seem to wake up in the morning and you open your eyes and you see a world of, of shapes and sizes and colors and different things, different objects, that that is not seeing. That's not seeing. To open your eyes and see the world in a fragmented way is, is literally distorted perception. And it's more, sometimes you could say, oh, it's just distorted. Well. Actually, perception is not seen. That's why the, the blind man and the man who can see, the blind woman and the woman who can see, they're the same, because they're both being perceived through the distorted lens of differences. And seeing does not involve the body's eyes. And hearing does not involve the body's ears. In fact, that's why the body and the world were made. The body's eyes were made not to see. And the body's ears were made not to hear. And we can call that self-deception. Not knowing your spiritual reality and coming up with a disguise so clever that you forget that it's a disguise, you forget that it's a mask. And you actually seem to open eyes in the morning and you get out of bed and you think you're seeing something. And you think you're hearing something. Or even in dreams at night when you're dreaming and you think you're seeing something happen in those nighttime dreams and hearing something. That's the same thing. That's all one category, not seeing. This is why this is pure non-duality. It's, it's showing that everything that seems common and accepted and normal and assumed to be true of this world is not true. Because it all comes from a dualistic belief system. And it's a dualistic 
perception and you will never be satisfied because why? The blind leading the blind fall in the pit. <laughs> and the goal is to see, to have spiritual vision. Now, it goes on to say, real vision is not limited to concepts such as near and far. We're not talking about remote viewing. Some of you have studied parapsychology and everything, and remote viewing and, and uh, astral travel, you know, perceiving other realms, going in your mind to other realms and doing visitations. We're not talking about all this stuff in parapsychology. Real vision is not limited to concepts such as near and far. Real vision is not only unlimited by time, by space and distance, but it is, does not depend on the body's eyes at all. The mind is its only source. Somebody asked me last night, you know, you're always talking about time, can we talk about space? And it's okay, let's talk about space too. That when you get into quantum physics and you get into the, the quantum field, you start to see that time and space are no factor at all. There's an interconnectivity in the unified field that has nothing to do with time or space. There's no distance in the quantum field. I like how the quantum physicists call it entanglement. <laughs> That's their word. <laughs> I call it oneness, they call it entanglement. Who cares? It's just a word. It's this, but the experience is there's no distance. So this goes way beyond even concepts of remote healing or beaming healing into troubled parts of the world. It's starting to see that you are going for an experience in which everything is light, pure light. And some of you have followed me along on YouTube. You know how every time I go to Europe or different places, amazing kind of symbols start to happen. Because one time I was over in Europe and People had been complaining for years. I would go around to just dif different countries and they were complaining about Catholicism and the Pope and everything. And, and then when I was in, over in Europe uh, more recently, Pope Francis was selected and elected. And the cheers went up. Finally, an, an innocent Pope. <laughs> so it's, he actually likes the ideas of simplicity and voluntary simplicity and non-judgment and so forth, started even bringing up, he said, well, maybe we should, you know, have female priests. You know, some of the stuff that was like the Vatican was like, ah, rocking. <laughs> like, oh my God, what happened? Where did he come from? But, you know, it was kind of interesting. Uh, also, I went over to Europe one time and that's when, um, in, uh, I think it was Bern, Switzerland, they have these the subatomic particle, the accelerator where they fire the particles. And they, they had made the discovery of the God particle. So anytime I hear anything about a God particle, I'm always, oh, what's that about? That's kind of, I'm curious when scientists um, name a particle God particle. Because science and religion don't, haven't been known. Now we know they are the same, but uh, it seems like they were apart. So, so when I investigated the God particle, it was like Einstein and, and most all of the scientists had agreed that Actually, Einstein said that everything in the cosmos is moving at the speed of light. Isn't that wonderful? Everything is moving at the speed of light. But there's this one particle that is everywhere in the cosmos that makes it appear as if some things are slowed down. That explains distorted perception objects. It's I call it the ego particle, but they call it the God <laughs> particle. I mean, if it's the one that's slowing things down and everything else is moving at the speed of light, <laughs> I would call it the ego particle. They don't like that joke, but I, I think it's good. <laughs> so what it is, it's so beautiful, is because what you start to see is that that's really everything moving at the speed of light. That's the vision that I just was talking about. That's what spiritual vision is. And it's only a belief in gradations and levels and fast and slow and all that that makes it seem appear gives the appearance of separate objects but actually you know we're getting it reflected everywhere from quantum physics through spirituality through metaphysics it's all coming in so how does that apply to you how does that apply to you in what seems to be your everyday life that's the exciting part isn't it who cares if you call it God or Atman or 
oneness or quantum field or, you know, who really cares anymore about the words? You know, we're getting to the point like, yeah, yada, 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 yada. Call no, we're not, we can't split hairs and, and become upset about words because, you know, they're just symbols. Symbols of symbols, twice removed from reality. How does it become practical? I would say this, is, is your focus, is your purpose. If your purpose is to open up to spiritual vision, if vision truly shows the love that is, the light that is, the oneness that is, then when you're tempted during the day to become distracted with goals, we'll call them time-space goals, of trying to attain something, accumulate something, achieve something, reach something, solve something, save something, anything of the world, when you're tempted to, for, to let your thoughts go towards that person, that thing, that project, that goal or whatever, that ambition, just remember that vision, spiritual vision is really what it's all about. That's why that's the idea that explains everything. God is in everything I see. It's, it's spiritual vision. God is in everything I see because God is in my mind. That vision is still within you. It's within us. It's within our mind. And that's the only thing. That's what everything is about. Don't be tempted to get into debates. Don't be tempted to get into arguments. Don't be tempted to get into taking sides. Don't be tempted into opinions. Don't be tempted into who's right and who's wrong. Isn't that a sneaky temptation as you move through your daily life? Just the temptation to take a side. Somebody says something to you and there's a part in your mind that wants to jump on it. Either wants to attack it, defend it, agree with it, disagree with it. All of it's a temptation. Instead of coming back to what is it that I truly want? What is it that I truly, truly, truly want? So you see, that's the focal point, is desiring to see. There are other workbook lessons. Above all else, I want to see things differently. That's talking about the same thing. Above all else, I want to see things differently. This light that I'm talking about, this vision, is pure innocence. It's pure happiness, it's pure joy, and that's why it's so important. It's, it's actually worthy of your attention. In fact, it's, it's the only thing that's worthy of your attention. That's a very interesting thing to explore as well. It's like saying the truth is true, and only the truth is true. The first time I read that in the Course, I was like, oh, come on, that's a little redundant, <laughs> you know, come on. You just stop. The truth is true, but you have to put on, and only the truth is true. And, and he goes on to say, what it means is, if you say the truth is true, it means, and only the truth is true, that there aren't different types of truth. There aren't different kinds of truth. It's singular. It's one. I mean, when I was growing up, I was, I was kind of on guard against all these books and people and places that said, we have the only way to God, we are the way, you are not, <laughs> we are, you aren't, this is, that, no. You know, I was, so, I was so on guard that I wanted to be more open-minded to that and I wanted to say, yeah, there's, there's many pathways to God and, and let's, why can't we just be open to the idea that there's many pathways to God? And then this thing of truth came up, and this sense that the truth is true, and only the truth is true, and then what about this idea that there are different truths? Can there be different? Can we not have many flavors of the rainbow? <laughs> and, uh, and then I read the Course, and that was the first law of chaos, that the truth is different for everyone. Chaos. <laughs> So you see where this is going. It's very, 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 very singular. We're not talking about concepts or theologies there. We're just saying that the truth, which is an experience that can't even be described or explained, is one. It's not, there are different truths. So this is beautiful. 
because we're focused on going for the experience. So I just threw all that out this morning at the beginning because I think as we go forward here in Strawberry, it's, it's so important to remember that you're going for an experience and you're going for an experience of true vision. Like, uh, what's the movie that came out this spring? Heaven is for real. Heaven is for real. And, and in that experience, this little boy, you know, is in the hospital. He didn't actually go through a dying experience, but he experienced this light. I think he saw Jesus, and he had these experiences. And that, we'll call it that blazing light that's not of this world, nothing like sunlight. That light is the purpose, it's the focus. And what I mean by that too is, anything else you can think of in your mind, anything, pales, pales, in comparison with that. So whatever ideas float through the mind, they can be about money and sex and what you're going to do with your day or what you're going to do with your future or thoughts about your relatives or thoughts about the environment or even thoughts about the comfort of the body, or the fatigue, or a slight feeling of tightness, or a slight feeling of feeling too hot or too cool. Any of those thoughts are really just covers over of this spiritual vision. So there you have it. That's our context. And I am here with you fully to join with you because I feel like this is an openness to deep, deep clarity. It's what the calling of your heart is. It's really the prayer of your heart, really, is always for, for spiritual vision. No matter what the form may seem to take on the surface, underneath, if you could really see the calling of your heart, it's calling out for this. It's saying, I really want this. I want to know who I am. I want to know this light. So I'll open it up for any questions, comments. Yes, Rick. Uh, I really want to hear what you said. We have a roving mic okay. we could use. If oh, no, 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 sir. No, no, no. Hearing. Uh, like, I want to get it. <laughs> um, Very good. Now that's a great example. What an what an exchange. No, no, I really. <laughs> um, Got it? Clearly I have resistance uh, to experiencing the oneness. Because um, my understanding is that it's been said that, that God knows nothing of this world. And I've held on to that as the symbol of separation. I chose to jump out of the love and land here. And my responsibility is to clear all of those ideas that I jumped into in order to realize oneness. And perhaps what you are saying is that when I stop looking and see, then I will be able to see God in all of this. In, in all of this. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's that's the forgiven world or the happy dream. And it's again coming back to that God is in everything I see because God is in my mind. And it's this experience of union with God that is reality. Uh, reality is not apart from God. It's kind of contradicting some of the New Age teachings of you can create your own reality. You know, as if you have the power to create your own reality different from God, or be a co-creator with God, 
and somehow co-create perception. All of those ideas are just more blocks to spiritual vision. They have no validity whatsoever. I think what's helpful, I remember when I went through the course just for years, deeper, 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 it's like, okay, what's, what's the key thing here? Is there a, like a key thing that I'm supposed to get from this whole book? If we can just get one key thing from all of this, it would be helpful. Because then I could just practice transferring it. Right? Finish reading and just transfer, 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 make no exception. And what I really liked about it, the key that I got from it was, um, don't try to bring truth into illusion. Bring illusions to truth. That was, that's what I finally got out of it. Like, if I could just get one thing that would serve my awakening, serve everyone, it would be that one thing. So if we, if we put the word God in place of truth, don't try to bring God into illusions. Bring illusions to God. And that is important because even the questions about whether God has anything, knows about the world, or what is it that's the God in me that can see the God in everyone, and if he says, it's God does not exist in that table as you see it, um, we could transfer that too, that God does not exist in those bodies as you see them either. It's just phraseology that's being used to really start to say, I need to just be open to letting this love in my heart just extend and extend and expand and expand, and that literally, whatever I perceive, will fade and fade and fade away. And, and also literally disappear into an experience, not disappear like magicians make things, but I mean literally fade and fade. So I think, I think you're on the right track because you're feeling it in terms of the love. That, that God, love, call it what you want, is just an expen expanding, extending thing and you do, deep down in your core, you want that to extend to everything, to be what it is, not to be a watered-down version of it. And so there is a way of looking upon the world of complete non-judgment, which is still perceptual, but that's an illusion too. But it's a very helpful illusion, because non-judgment <laughs> is a much closer reflection to abstraction or heaven than anything that judgment offers. Judgment is the, is the block. Uh, Holy Spirit also for me tends to get, tends to stand between me and God, in that Holy Spirit is the communication mechanism. So the, the, con just the concept of Holy Spirit for me has sort of held me back from considering that I can have a direct or be God. You know, there's the, the wrong-mindedness, the right-mindedness, and then the atonement. And I'm not at atonement yet, and I need Holy Spirit. And therefore I'm telling myself I cannot have the direct experience of God. And, and the proof of that is that I need Holy Spirit. That's what I'm telling myself. Yeah, and what's so great about it is that with me speaking today and with Lisa Karen speaking this afternoon, um, regardless of what words we use, and we can use many, many, many different words, but it's going to be the escape from concepts. It's, it's going to be the absolute dropping of absolutely every concept. And you can tell that even a system like A Course in Miracles, even non-dual systems like in China and India, even Advaita Vedanta and everything, there's words involved, there's concepts involved. And what I'm sharing, what Lisa's going to be sharing this afternoon, is really an invitation to drop it all. Absolutely drop it all. And, and it will be fun for you all to hear it in different dialects, in different language, because there's a, there's a content, there's an essence behind, there's a presence that's being shared, that it's okay to drop it all, including the concept of the Holy Spirit, including concepts of the Trinity, including concepts of, of forgiveness, whatever it's believed to be. There's an experience, you see, that's everything. And it's, it's free 
of concepts. It's absolutely, completely, utterly free of concepts. And therefore, you can see you'll be free of debate. <laughs> you've got no concepts, you've got nothing left to debate about. <laughs> Talk about being happy and laughing and joyful and free. It's an experience of no concepts. So, that's the invitation. And then, like you're saying, if you notice a resistance comes up, well, how wonderful that you're allowing it up, actually. How wonderful. Because resistance doesn't seem to feel good, and then you have an impetus to let go. You see how wonderful that is? Yes, I do. And um, at the moment, I'm letting it go to Holy Spirit. And you're saying, okay, allow that to evaporate as well. So all I'm doing is trusting myself. You're ultimately, yeah, your right. your true self, your higher self. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. And that's why I have so much fun, even when I seem to trail around the world, because when I'm like sitting at a, at a tire shop or a muffler shop or whatever, and somebody will strike up a conversation. I had this one woman, I think I was in a muffler shop, or, and the woman sitting next to me, and she, she looks at me and she starts off with what some people call a loaded question, but I just don't think there's anything, I don't see loaded questions. I don't even think that, I don't, can't even conceive of a loaded question. She, look, she smiles and she look, turns and looks at me and she said, do you know the name of God? That was the, that's the opening question at the muffler shop. Do you know the name of God? And some people say that's a loaded question, but I just don't see any loaded questions. I feel so in love with everyone, so connected. I don't even care what anyone professes to believe or not believe. I don't believe in this believer, non-believer, all these. I mean, empty of all concepts. So, what came out of my mouth was, tell me. That's all I can say. <laughs> she said, do you know the name of God? I said, tell me. And, and what she followed up with, she could have said anything. She could have said Fred, or <laughs> Louise, or whatever. And, and because I don't believe that what is undefinable actually has a name, including God, that word, you know, it's beyond the words, it's beyond the concepts, and beyond the, the names. To see how much fun we had, and oh, did we have fun, because she told me, what the real name of God was, and I was like just adoring her, and she was having so much fun talking to me. <laughs> and that's the way that it goes. You see, if once you start to realize that, that the only place where we seem to split hairs, or ever have an upset or difference, it's all about belief. You know, who believes what, and who has truer beliefs, and which beliefs are true, and which beliefs are false. They're all false. <laughs> They are. All of them. Every last one of them. And I'm delighted <laughs> to actually have some fun now in coming to that experience that they're all false. So you'll see that in my talks, you'll hear that in, with Lisa Cairns this afternoon. That's the fun of it. The fun of it is that you can't really take anything seriously because it's just belief. This is a realm of beliefs. Not, it's not reality, but it's a realm of beliefs. But the only difficulty comes in is when you start to draw a line. As if there's a you that believes something and another that believes something else. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy to think that there's separate beings with different <laughs> belief systems. Private minds, private thoughts. No two people see the same world, you know. And, and that's what quantum physics would say. It's, it's just a product of consciousness, but no two people see the same world. I don't find that depressing, because I know there are no two people. <laughs> That's the, the fun part. That's where you feel this connection of God is in everything I see. It doesn't matter what the words are. It doesn't matter what the facial gestures are. It doesn't even matter what the energy is. You know, I mean, when I, I was just got back from Sedona, and they say, oh, vortex over there, and good energy, and go into a shop, and ooh, there's good energy there, and everything. That's the funniest thing to me. Good energy and bad energy. I mean, if you really subscribe to good energy and bad energy, then you could still call yourself a victim. Whenever you were in the bad energy, <laughs> you could say, well, I'm victimized by the bad energy. I need to move over there. 
get into the good energy, but you see you're still dependent then. That can't be the truth. People tell me, oh, be careful, you got to protect yourself. I say, protect myself? That's the funniest thing, protect <laughs> myself from what? Well, certain things in the world and then energies and aliens and abductions and, oh my God, you know. But I just, I think it's funny. Protecting is funny to me. Protecting what? You know, I just don't get it. What is need of protection? You know, it's, it, and that's only because the mind is emptied of concepts. People say, oh, did you hear that? That's a good teacher. Oh, that's a bad teacher. Oh, did you hear what that teacher did? And, you know, it's like concepts, concepts, concepts. Even words, use of words. That's the fun, I think, of this retreat. That's really, really why I invited Lisa Cairns to come. It's because she has absolutely nothing to do with this and no knowledge of it. I think that's delightful. Uh, I haven't seen it for a while either. I just saw it around this morning. But, but isn't that fun? Wouldn't you want that? Wouldn't you want to be able to feel presence, whatever the words seem to be, and not try to do the mental gymnastics of trying to pair up certain things, like Holy Spirit and God and where does this fit and so on and so forth. You know, to me that's delightful. That is true freedom, when you're beyond all interpretation of words. And what but concepts limit, you know, what but concepts bring the filter of what the words mean. The words don't really mean anything in and of themselves, but if there's a reaction then, aha, you've got a, an identity concept to look at. We were, at, Lisa and I were in the hot tub today, and we were just laughing and laughing and laughing because it's like within A Course in Miracles, you know, there, there seems to be all these different people and trains of thought and camps and all these crazy hierarchies and all these things. And it's the same, she said, in uh, non-duality. There's just all these different flavors and versions and one can walk in, oh, there, there are those kind of non-dual and then there are these <laughs> kind of non-duals, you know. It's like, what does non-dual mean? <laughs> Not two, and it, how could you have those and these, and them and this? You know, it's the most common thing. I mean, but, you know, you end up being like a stand-up comedian uh, when you start to see how funny all of it is. I would go around to all these Unity churches, and uh, I would go in and I would just have lunch with them and talk with them, and I noticed that they never use the word died or dead or death. It's just like you go to all these Unity churches, I said, after doing this for years, I thought, this is amazing. No one ever dies in unity. They make their transition. They pass. You see how they say pass? <laughs> some people will say fart, some people will say pass wind, you see? Some people say, they died. <laughs> so like, no, no, please. They made their transition. So I was there and finally they were saying, please. Transition. They made their transition. So I said, to where? And they said, to the other side. I say, this is unity. How many sides are there in unity? This, who, somebody's got to play the, the emperor's got no clothes. Who's going to finally just say, wait a minute, can we stop with this, these concepts? There aren't any other sides. There is no afterlife. Or before life, that's, you know, these are concepts of linear time. Where did you come from? Where did your soul come from before it entered this life? You see, you could get into a whole thing. That's what psychic readings and past life regressions, and the deeper you go into this, if you really see it's just about emptying your mind of all concepts, then it gets funnier and funnier and funnier. <laughs> because you've got nothing to cling to. You know, who were you in a past life? Cleopatra. No, we don't have to go back there. <laughs> we don't have to try to figure any of that out. It's, it's so important just to allow ourselves to be fully present. Fully present, fully open. Yes? You know, maybe I can share about a glimpse I had. Is that where you are? When, I, when I first met David, I had a glimpse of the unified awareness and uh, the vision, actually, just beyond form. 
and I had this desire to try just to um, not have any concepts in my mind anymore and I joined with David and it was like my mind merged with his spirit sitting with David, David's mind and and I went for probably three weeks, I don't know, it was beyond time and space and um, I was so high uh, in this light experience, there was no person and uh, it was so simple. Like it was, it was almost like it just happened, you know. That was the desire and the prayer that I had, but it just happened. And it went on for three weeks or whatever. And in that time, I there was some awareness that I needed to invite the concepts that I did have in the personal mind up to awareness. So I did because of the trust that I had to spirit in the form of David, through David, through that joining. So after about three weeks, I woke up and went downstairs. And it was like I was back in time. And there was a table in the room. Because through those weeks, there was no table. There was unified awareness. God wasn't everything I saw. It was vision. And, but that day, there was a table in the room and I said there was something in me that was like triumphing like, like the ego was came to David and said oh David I, I see a table don't you see a table I see the table you know and I'm right it was this it was actually a rebellious thing you know but it was and he was so gentle he knew I needed to go through that and he was like yeah 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 it's a matter of time the table is a matter of time that was his answer, and I thought it was brilliant, you know. It was a belief in time, and yeah. But it was, I don't know what, I just felt to share it because it's on this thing, and, and yeah. Like, I think it was how involuntary it is. Like, you don't have the effort. No one have, ever has the effort to you know, work on the enlightenment thing or get there or whatever. Simple. I think too the humor and the laughter and the lightness, you know, when you start to think, okay, yeah, spiritual vision, but just think humor, laughter, love, lightness, you know, um, <coughs> I think it was maybe last week, a friend of mine from Florida sent me a, a YouTube video, but it was Jim Carrey delivering a commencement speech at Maharishi University in Iowa. And I was like, oh my, i got to open this one up. And I just, I laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed, and then I had to take it out and show it. It's got as many people as I could to get the project, you know, get to show it. And we all just took a pause in the middle of the day to just watch it and laugh because it was so touching how it would just come through in that it was a presence that was coming through a presence poking fun at the things of the world um, poking fun at really the things that would be important even for a commencement class you know it was he had a big painting that he had done which was an, an <laughs> amazing uh, group of symbols that he had put out for everyone to use. And there he was, just in presence, just glowing and shining. And, and it just shows because, you know, it has nothing to do with, with like spiritual symbols or whatever. You know, laughter, the love, the lightness, that's what it's all about. That's what truth ultimately is. It's light. It doesn't take anything seriously, and he's been using all this laughter. And then also recently with uh, with Robin Williams and that whole experience, you know, those kind of reflections started to come out from all over about the love and the laughter that that really we can feel in our hearts. It transcends the body. It transcends this world. It just feels so so real. So I think that's really what we're here for is just to have that experience. And, and again, it's, 
I find it's it very, very natural. It's, it's just unnatural to try to categorize things, to try to categorize, arrange, order things, and try to get meaning out of, of symbols and images and out of those organizations. It's like an invitation to be free, to be childlike again, you know? Really childlike, where you don't seem to know what things mean and you don't really care. Like when you're playing in the creek when you're a kid, you're playing, you're full on into play. It's everything. The whole world feels playful when you're playing. You're not interested in anything else. And to me that's that single attention that we're called into. I see some hands go up. Okay. Huh? Okay. Um, well, I had a wonderful experience this morning, David, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, when I woke up, um, first thing I did was use my iPhone to look at today's lesson, which is, fear is not justified in any form. 260, uh, 240. Fear is not justified in any form. And then my mind started thinking of all these forms of fear that I have. Uh, but usually have it having to do with uh, uh, judgment. Oh, I like this, I don't like that. Oh, I don't like the sound of this. Uh, I don't like the looks of that person. I don't like this, this stuff, I don't like that stuff. And how my, my mind is so littered, just polluted with all that. And so, um, so I've been practicing uh, letting go of, of um, all these judgments, uh, like driving here, looking at rocks and looking at the mud and, and, and all that sort of thing. And then um, when, you, when you read those first 10 lessons, that really hit home. And then 29 and 30 especially, because God is, I see everything, uh, I see God in everything because God is in my mind. And that's just really hitting home to me. And then, then the last, what you said a few minutes ago about this invitation to let go of all concepts. And I thought of, that wonderful paragraph in Lesson 189, which I used to know, but, you know, just merely do this, just do this. Let go of everything, you know, everything you think you know, everything about God, everything about the Course, and just come to God with your, with completely open hands, completely open arms. And that's, that's the experience I'm looking for. I mean, that's, I want to experience that. I have this intellectual understanding of, oh, yeah, I can see how that, no, 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 I don't want that. I want an experience of that. And I think that's what you said you were offering us. Correct? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's also, I think when, you, when I say Am let I go right? of all, all <laughs> concepts, I'm also saying right. let go of all concepts about cause and effect. Right. And, and that really runs deep too, you know. So it could be this a simple thing of, um, of like, you know, how did these rocks get to be this way, or how did this uh, center or monastery come to be? You know, even like kind of sometimes introductory things, that, you know, where you, it's kind of, I call them icebreakers. We don't even need to break ice. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'll find that delightful about Lisa. She's not going to come here to break ice with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, could some see it's like a sledgehammer, but, but it's, it's really not to kind of ease in. It's just come into this experience where you can really let go of the why questions and you can let go of the wondering. Um, years ago, I think I was in, um, I think I was in Lexington, Kentucky and I was taking a walk with a friend of mine who, who was a, in a Lexington Symphony and a violinist, first violinist and this and this and we went on this walk and, and as he was walking, he was, like you were with your driver, he was looking at the rocks and the trees and the leaves, almost like a little child, you know, who's going on a walk in nature, very curious. I wonder where this river goes, I wonder where that road goes, I wonder how these, that rock formation came in. And it was, a, it was like walking with a little child who was very, very curious. And so he was wondering, 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 that was the whole walk. Was, I wonder, 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 wonder. And then, so then finally he looked at me and he says, what do you think? And, and the Spirit just went, wonder, 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 who, who wrote the Book of Love? And he just, we just laughed together, because, because really that's how light the Spirit is. The Spirit can give you a little jingle 
uh, of, it doesn't really matter, you know, because the love is what it's all about. And then the ego is the opposite. The ego thinks everything matters, and it's got tit for tat, and or even judging and self-judging. Oh, you like, you like that rock? You saw that rock? Uh, we, you know, even we were talking this morning about heads turning, you know, and because sometimes you find your eyes are just drawn to look at people or avoid looking at certain people or look at things and avoid. Just allow, just allow, 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 because the, the inner critic is the ego. It's always trying to shape and control things and analyze things. Oh, you looked at her. You look. You looked at her for five seconds. You know, you can hear this voice going, what does that mean? You know, it's like the critic, the psychoanalyzer of there, it's always trying to make a problem out of everything. And really, there's, there's nothing to get hung about. There's, you, you know, it's, it's much to do about nothing. And slowly, we're, it seems we're being convinced. I, I'd say that the reason that I'm here, the reason I'm sharing and extending and everything is just, it's just purely for inspiration. Just to, if anyone even seems to be inspired by that and feels like, I think I'm going to drop my judgment too, <laughs> then that's wonderful. Not that there has to be people dropping it, but it's just how, how freeing it is to live without judgment. And it's also, you can let go of this fear that, ooh, ooh, ooh if I, if I really let go of all that mind chatter and I get let go of all the judgment, then I'll I'll surely die. It's it's not that at all. That's actually when you live, <laughs> and and no, nothing's taken away. I, I people have said to me sometimes like, oh, you're so devoted on this spiritual journey and everything, but what has it cost you? You know, what's the, what kind of question is that? You know, nothing. Really, you know, I mean, I honestly can say that. I don't really feel that I've ever lost anything. And in, in, in the present moment, you, you can see how true that is. It's always you. It's always there. It's so, so loving. And there's no loss involved. There's no sacrifice. So it's the anticipation where the struggle comes in. And it's the acceptance is where the joy is. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Yes. <laughs> the hands are out. Is it coming? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I was so inspired by the lesson and what you said. And at the moment, just when I think of God, like my inner definition is the divine matrix of all that is consciously experiencing the bliss of itself. And, um, and for me, the fruit of reading the, the disappearance of the universe that got me really into the course uh, at that point was um, when I was a little kid, um, I'd go to sleep at night, I get these, there'd be these dots you know, these like swirly little dots everywhere, and it'd be the same if my eyes were open or my eyes were closed. And um, and over the years, I've noticed that um, like anything I look at is made of all these little light dots. You know, it's just like, and they're all the same. They're the same whether it's the table or the glass or you or nothing or something. And somehow, in reading the disappearance of the universe, it got for me. All of a sudden, it dawned on me that. Um, you know, we were like the Star Trek holodex matrix, and we go in and, and say star program, and there's you and this and this. But then it all goes back to this dot, 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 everywhere. And so when I'm in anywhere, I can just do this kind of little shift and just look at the dots, and it's really beautiful. And there's been another, you know, and I realized at some point, oh my gosh, this isn't reality. My dots are my reality. But then it's a fun place for me to go to, even when things get intense, is just go to the dots. And um, and when people, uh, recently I had an experience where when like somebody got really angry at me. And for the first time, I just kind of watched it go through. And when I look at people like these li little energy aches of just like, Things are just flowing around, and I didn't decide to grab it. I just kind of, 
and it went on by. And so I guess I kind of think of, you know, enlightenment is this word of this retreat, of one of them, one of those words. And um, I feel enlightened. I mean, I, I believe I'm already enlightened. And I think that that's important, like a decision that, hey, I'm there. And the aspect of light to enlightenment has really intrigued me. Because when I look at all this dot matrix, I really don't think it's visual. I don't think it's the little thing associated with the eyeballs. It's something like way more that makes me really blissful just to do that funny little shift. It, it takes me to this really happy place. No matter what's happening or going on, I can always be in the dots. And um, it, yet there's a light and dark quality to them. And when you ex described your experience, you know, of, and when many people that I've read describe their enlightenment experience, and it's, it's an experience at a certain point in time where there's blazing light. And I'm intrigued, I, I haven't experienced the blazing light, and yet there is this permeation of the gentle uniformity of everything in this thing that I can shift into. And um, so I'm curious, and I've never heard anybody say, oh, I went into the light and I stayed there forever. You know, because maybe they just wouldn't be here anymore. So I guess I'm asking, and when I look, there's an aspect of darkness there too. It's not like a uniform field of light I'm shifting into. So I, I'm inquiring about the light of enlightenment, or the great rays maybe that they refer to, I don't know. And I just toss that out. Well, I, I'm glad you brought it up because I will say that that this world is backwards and upside down, and <coughs> and it's a when you see it in its fragments, it's a projected world of of ego and indifferences. But but the unified field, and it sounds like your your dot experience, your dot matrix is 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 the way you tap into the unified field. That's why it's so happy, because it, it's, it's all, um, it permeates, you use the word permeate, it's, it just permeates everything of, the, of time and space. So I think that that's an, a, a good aspect, that's like a symbol for you, that you, how you perceive it, that is, is comforting and, and like calling you and drawing you, and it's always there, and you can all, you know, it's there to go back and tap into. It's interesting with the world of time and space because there seems to be an emphasis on bodies and doing. You know, Spike Lee did the movie Do the Right Thing, and that seems to be a big deal uh, in, on planet Earth, do the right thing. Morality and ethics and do the right thing and, um, and what's, what's good and what's a sin and all this and this. I'd say um, as you drop all the concepts and every last one is dropped, then you have this experience that transcends the doer. So it's, you know, like Frank Sinatra's dooby dooby doo, do dooby doo doo. You don't have that <laughs> dooby doo, it's just bee 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 <laughs> bee 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 bee. You know, you see it's the it's not there's not a vacillation. It's that's really where the struggle comes in. It's the do part. Isn't, isn't that really the, the struggle? Did I do enough? Could I have done more? You know, it's always there is an evaluation involved when the, the doer is, is seen as real. And imagine if, if, like you're describing like this dot matrix, you know, it's where everything is, is dots. It doesn't matter what, eyes closed, eyes open, table, chair, cliff, da da tree, dot, 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 dot. That's like a symbol of the unification. So to me, I think that's just a symbol of, of your mind going into that. And you know, like that James Taylor song, when this old world starts a getting me down, you know, it's called up on the roof, but yours could be da, 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 you know, because it's, it's the dots. It's, it's the unified field that, that is really impersonal. And that is what makes it, you know, it permeates through everything. It's not contained. It's not limited. 
That's that's like an inroads. I just think that's the symbol that your mind feels <laughs> comfortable. You've come through chemistry and all kinds of symbols of chemistry. <laughs> your mind was fascinated matter, fascinated with matter and symbols, and now the dots are are kind of a way of yeah of expansive perception. Well, what do you think of the light? I mean, what do you think about is is there an innate aspect of enlightenment that includes some aspect of light as we think of it? Well, again, let's go back, let's use Einstein. Um, Einstein called this world an optical delusion. That was, it's kind of an interesting name coming from Albert Einstein. And then, of course, he said that everything is moving at the speed of light. So the light, I would equate with reality, it does, it's actually beyond speed, you know, we use speed in terms of like light years and particles and so forth, but, but it's just like wisdom and understanding and that's what's real. So a lot of times people say, well, so-and-so was a great saint and a great mystic and he hung on for 70 or 80 years so he could continue his teachings and transmissions to the planet. Well, actually, there's a line in the Course that flips that one all the way around and Jesus said, there are those who have laid aside their body in order to increase their helpfulness. You see, isn't that a beautiful line? Laid aside the body in order to increase their helpfulness. Everything's upside down. Words seem important, teachings seem important, teachers seem important, transmissions seem important. No, no, no. It's this this world, again, perception is a veil over the light. And, you know, it's the reason you hear so many say, I went into the light and I, and I came back, is, is because, you know, that experience of light and perception, they don't ultimately go together. It's, it's the disappearance of the universe, which you were so inspired by, is like a destiny. And it's not that you're trying to speed anything up or slow anything down, but it's just being present giving yourself permission to go fully into that. Or like this dot experience, that can be like part of your calling, you know, to, to give yourself permission to go, like the child that just adored that, said, oh, this is wonderful, to give yourself permission to open to that, to keep opening. It's beautiful. And then as far as the light, you know, it's described as if you have to be really revelation ready, so it's been described, even with Helen and Bill, I mean, Helen had a revelatory experience, but, but Bill didn't, but Bill tr kept transferring the training and just, you know, giving himself permission, permission to go deeper and deeper and deeper, and that's really what it's all about. You know, it's, it's just giving yourself that allowance and permission. Thank you. We've got two right here. Casey's had her hand waiting there. kind of forgotten some of the thread of it, but um, one of the first things you said um, that stood out for me was the thing about being blind and seeing as being the same. Well, so right before you started talking, my glasses got put back there and got put up here and then thrown on the ground, and I'm going, I'm on the road for a couple months and I have no glasses and I, you mentioned Stevie Wonder, and I'm imagining somebody helping me down the trail and to my tent and back, and and you know I just saw how I can get attached, you know, to I've got to see, and then looking at the whole completely other thing of vision and and what is that really? And anyway, it just felt so in in congruence with what you were talking about, because I'm sitting here going, oh my God, what if that had happened? And, um, and then just letting it go to, wow, vision. And it, it was a gift to me to have that happen so I could really look through that. So. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, because I think that's the thing. If you have a context of you're just opening to spiritual vision, then anything at all that would even seem to happen in perception, you, oh, you have this context, like it's all working together for that. Like I think of the, the pretty famous teacher Ram Das, 
you know, would be here now. And, you know, he taught, he traveled for so many years, and then, you know, a number of years ago, he was, he had a stroke. And he, he went down to the floor, he was laying there having his stroke, and he was noticing the tile ceiling, and just looking it up at all these tiles, just noticing as he's laying there. And then, then he noticed the first thought that came into his mind, which was, look at this, Mr. God is having a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that wonderful that, that he's so candid to share his, his experience of what's going on in his mind, his consciousness during the stroke. Look at this, Mr. God is having a stroke. And then he just had bought a new car, and the body couldn't move, and the thoughts were like, wow, I can't drive now. You know, I have a new car, and can't eat, can't speak. You know, much of the life was speaking going to lots of places and speaking, couldn't speak, and so forth. He's kind of, it's been beautiful that he was so transparent all about his thoughts, because it, it all comes under, wow, it's an opening to spiritual vision. And you see how the ego wants to make things into good things and bad things. Ego would say to have a so-called healthy body that has free speech and good eyesight, good hearing, good range of movement and everything is good, 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 good. Stroke. Ooh, ooh, no. That would be the not. You see how the ego wants to divide everything into good and bad. And isn't that the, one of the most basic dualities? Good and bad, good and bad. Is that good? Is that bad? It's like this thing that just, just like computers, one and zero, one and zero. Just binary, one and, good and bad, good and bad. And it just goes on and on and on. And this is really an invitation to just, to drop beneath that and say, wow, I'm going to allow myself to drop underneath that, and it's safe. I will still exist. In fact, I will know <laughs> my existence when I drop be beyond these dualistic concepts. And that's how precious it is. I mean, when people tell me things, like, and they do say sometimes, they say, David doesn't have all of his marbles, or David's not all there or whatever, you know, I actually take that as a compliment. Because that's, that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> I've lost all my marbles and I'm not all there. Uh, wherever there is, you know. Because it's in a time-space thing, so, yeah. This stroke was a gift. A yeah. spiritual gift. Yes. Gift, used very well. And right behind you, the white light experience, coming out of it, everything was like see-through. And I'm curious, does that ever become a day-to-day -day reality thing, or like a, a stepping stone along the way, where your day-to-day -day perceptions is like you can see through things, but then when, once you touch it and everything came solid again? Yeah, I think the, the revelation experience I was describing, it's, it's, it wasn't quite a see-through thing in terms of seeing through objects. It was the objects were gone. I mean, everything was gone. I mean, there was the light, like you're talking about, and then like when it started coming back down, coming back to this, it was like I could see through the door, could see the sidewalk through the apartment door, and could look through the refrigerator, and then I went to put my hand through the door, everything became solid again. Yeah, yeah, I think you're describing, that's kind of that transition point of, of, of the solidness is where is the distortion. Because if everything is mind, everything is consciousness, and, and literally that see-through experience you're describing is a beautiful kind of symbol of, of it's not what it seems to be. It's like nothing is solid, is what I'm hearing. So, I, I would say, um, you do have an experience, and this is what healed perception is about, where it's described in A Course in Miracles exactly this way. The body's eyes will continue to report differences, but the healed mind puts them into one category. They are unreal. I, that's, of all the senses in the Course, I was like, my gosh, he's even describing the happy dream. In great detail, the body's eyes will continue to report the differences. Of course, that's what they were made for. <laughs> they, they weren't made from vision, they, they were made to cover over vision. So, as you go deeper into this stillness, this non-judgment, the body's eyes will continue to report differences, 
that the healed mind will put them into one category, there and real. <coughs> now also I tell people, don't, don't try to explain this to your parents or your friends <laughs> or whatever, because it's all for you, so to speak. In other words, it's not transferable. It's not like you can just knock on your neighbor's door and go, listen. <laughs> you know? and, and therefore, it's, it's a good kind of rule of thumb. Don't, don't think that you have to declare and announce and speak about something that's not your experience. You don't get any brownie points like for <laughs> talking good words or, you know, having accurate metaphysics or any of those things. It's just speak from experience. And what you're sharing is, this was an experience that you had. I'm curious about, does it become, like for you, is it, does it ever become day to day? Or is it just like that little flash in the pan thing? I, I think actually the day to day has gone too. Yeah, even that, you know, that that's like a mindset too. Jesus will talk, talk, talk in the Course, and then he says, but what did, can this mean to those who still count the hours and the days? You know, even as we do in common language, the day-to-day -day experience, you hear the day-to-day -day is in there. So, it, you just have these deep experiences and they transfer and they transfer and they transfer. And what it really feels like is that it's, it's like holographic, it's like everything and everyone of the whole universe is, like I can feel them all with us now, so to speak. Like, like the body's eyes may report so many bodies and a wood structure and some canyons off in the distance and everything, but that's not my experience. I don't, that feels very contained. <laughs> that's like a little tiny sliver or container, and that's not uh, my experience. So when people talk about everything, I see that everything's an idea. Like for example, we'd be, we'd be talking and somebody goes, France. Now, an untrained mind would think that there's an actually a country that you can actually take an airplane to and fly to. But I just know that France is just a concept. It's just another concept among concepts. Same about the United States. You can see as you start to just begin to get an inkling to see that everything is in mind, everything is consciousness, and nothing is apart from mind. They would say, oh well, no, well, yes it's true, France is a concept, but there's an if actual country, if you fly across uh, the Atlantic Ocean, you can actually like land <laughs> there, and they go, we, they say, <laughs> they actually have a language, <laughs> they've got a language, and you know, it's actually, it's, but, but the more you go into this quantum experience, you start to see that everything is an idea, everything, without exception. Cancer and France are the including same. Including the see-through stuff. Including the see-through stuff, yeah. Okay. It's all the same. Last night was time and space are just concepts too. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Yeah, there are scientists that um, it was interesting. Some they showed me a program where they were they not only talk about the Big Bang, but they had mapped the Big Bang as like as a picture. It looked like when it was mapped out, it was like a static picture. But you know how the Course says, you know, it's, it's all over and done. It, it kind of implies that, that the cosmos is, is like, just this, like a snapshot. And what they described was that inside the picture, depending on where you perceive it, it seems to be moving, it still seems to be in motion, but Jesus tells us the world was over long ago. He's actually, if you pull some lines from the Course, this snapshot that they've actually mapped the entire Big Bang, it's only from inside of it that they're still saying it seems to be expanding and that it will reach a point where it will reach equilibrium and then it will kind of go the other way and will, but that's from inside of it. But from, they've like mapped the whole thing. So they're showing all the little co coordinates and everything. That's not the human being experience of time and space. It seems to be constantly changing, constantly in motion. Lisa will talk about this a lot. 
You'll hear a lot about that in everything's in motion, everything's just moving, moving. It, it's how it seems inside of it. But wh where does that relate with the script is written? It sounds more again like a snapshot. The script is written, that's a line from the workbook of A Course in Miracles. So, you know, it's all about shifting the perception, like those early lessons that we were talking about. You know, lesson number seven, I see only the past. You know, that's a key idea. If you come to a place, actually, where you're just saying, everything I perceive is the past, then actually that's the release point. That's the release point. Why would that be the release point? Because you wouldn't make an effort to change the past, right? <laughs> the past is the past, and the past is gone. Why would you try to change it? You see how freeing that would be? Then you wouldn't try to improve the world. You wouldn't try to save the world. You wouldn't try, if you had a partner, you wouldn't try to make the partner better, or hope the partner would change. Like, eventually they'll come around, no? It's not going to happen. <laughs> That, you see how freeing that is? How, how practical that would be, even in relationships, of having no inkling of trying to change anything or anyone. And doesn't that relate to no control over the world? Doesn't that relate to, relate to the serenity prayer? Some of you have come through into sobriety through that, you know, which is basically, you know, what you can change, what you cannot, and the wisdom to know the difference. You know, that they're all, all these pathways are leading to this one experience. Let all things be exactly as they are. Accept everything exactly as it is. Byron Katie, loving what is. You could just, it goes on and on. It's like the whole universe is singing to us. Did you get it? We'll try, we'll try this. Did you get it? You know, it's just like lovingly singing to us, saying, you're so loved, you're so beautiful, you're so perfect. You can just accept it. And time and space are the same. It's on. It's on. <laughs> no, it's on. Okay. Um, I don't know whether it's a concept or an, an experience, but I frequently go to this place where everything phenomenal, it's like you had a big blanket and you just put everything in it and tied up all the corners and just ignored it. And then everything else is this uh, abstract nothingness just abstract and i just you know that that brings me i don't know it just takes me out of the world and i just wanted to share that and see if you had anything to say about it okay i love hearing these things the, <laughs> the dot matrix and now you're you're nothing blanket. you're nothing blanket of, and then the nothingness see those are just those are just symbols of reminder. How wonderful that you just allow yourself to go, go there. You give yourself full permission, like, yes, this is wonderful. There's nothing being lost. We had a hand up down here? Yeah. Here, here it comes. <laughs> you started out at the beginning talking about pain and discomfort. And... Uh, they seem very absorbing to me. How do you go to a place of laughter, happiness, when you've got that hanging there? Yeah, to me it's, it's a question of, um, of what is it for, because no doubt pain, discomfort, they seem to be like real attention grabbers, attention getters, you know, as you go through. And so for me, as I went into this, um, I experienced, there was a line that said, an untrained mind can accomplish nothing. I think all of us have kind of this awareness that whatever we call the spiritual journey, or path of awakening, or healing, or whatever we call it, we, we see that it does seem to involve some discipline. Uh, just like if you were training in karate, or tai chi, or even learning how to ride a bike or learning how to read, there's, a, there's almost like a, a training or a discipline that's involved in becoming proficient. So, your question is like, how do we go from discomforts or pain into laughter? It, it's a, there's a transformation there that that's just 
seems to involve a, a, a mental discipline, a mind training, um, just like they talk about the yogis, you know, that, that meditate for 10, 12, 16 hours a day. That's their pathway. They, they really focus on that. And they don't, I'm sure they could tell you they have discomforts and distractions that come up. Even people now that go to these Vipassana retreats, you know, where there's, you know, long stretches of silence, or uh, a friend of mine, Jasmine down in Australia, she used to have these retreats in Thailand where uh, I think you had to stop eating for like two, three, four weeks before the retreat. And then if you haven't eaten for weeks, um, you go there and you only get water um, at the retreat. It's completely dark. Everything is completely <laughs> dark. So you you walk in there, you've been not been eating for weeks just to prepare, and then you finally get there and they give you water and yes, there's there's toilets and beds and everything. It's all walled off, it's all completely dark. It's pitch black. So and she, I'm like, Okay, this is this is the way the training goes. She said, Oh yeah, people get accustomed, they can find their way to the toilet and and do everything. Their their senses other senses get stronger when, when this, the visual thing is completely taken out of the picture. But they, oh, you better believe discomforts come up because of that. But it's kind of showing you that it's like, it's part of a discipline that inside you just say yes to. Sometimes, it, like with this, it came in the form of um, a text, a, t a workbook, and a teacher's manual. And I kind of like that in the sense that those lessons I was reading to you are like very practical. One, one lesson per day, and really it doesn't take much time to do, but it's like it reorients the mind and it's like saying, hey, I'll work with whatever you believe in. You know, it never t told me to stop eating or stop having sex or stop doing, stop breathing or <laughs> something <laughs> like this. It was just saying, here, let's try these on and we'll take you step by step. So just, as for example, the workbook that I was reading from is, is a discipline. It's a discipline of training the mind and transferring the ideas. And there are many others um, that are also very, very helpful. So that's, that's the, the how. That's the how question we were talking about. Because the mind is looking for practicalities. You know, it's looking to be reached. Like, reach me. Don't just, all is God, all is one, all is happy. What about discomfort I have in my shoulder? or whatever, you know, then that's exactly how it, it happens. And also I would say that's how it's gone in the sense that the more I got into my, my function, I mean it started for me seemingly in my 20s where I had this calling and then let go of university and let go of relationships and let go of ambitions and goals and all kinds of things of the world and just said, okay, you're mine now, use me in any way that is helpful. That was kind of like my calling moment where I said, I'm yours, completely. And then from that, there was a lot of instructions given and a lot of, of guidance and prompts and that was you know, years ago, because this body's 56 now, so that was in the, when the body was in the late 20s. It was a life of devotion, um, just of you're, I'm yours, I will do whatever, I will follow, and help me wash away this sense of a doer. Help me wash away this identification with the body. That's where the discomforts are arising. When we're spirit and we misidentify, we, we identify with the body instead of the spirit, then all kinds of things seem to arise. Only for the healing, not, not that they're good or bad, you know, any of the, the feelings. It's just, just an opportunity. So thank you, that's a beautiful practical question. Okay. How are we doing? Oh, getting right. We're just getting close to our lunch break time. Well, Ricky's back, so. <laughs> I've been out there in the sun. <laughs> I think. Like last night, we could have, could we have a, a closing song?
was like, cursing went out. <laughs> you feeling it? Cursing, are you feeling quantum? All right, Eric. Yay. Eric. Yay, yay. Here they are, re reunited <laughs> for quantum love. <laughs> Of you guys, if some of you have heard it, maybe some of you have a little sneak preview. It's quantum physics, baby. Love radiates. I'm getting <laughs> We have Eric around, though. Well, uh, we only have one guitar, so it's just, trust me, it's best if Eric plays guitar. <laughs> Kirsten got the download for this song. I put music to it, and then Eric put use it to it. <laughs> rehearse this together since we recorded the CD. We can do it.